What I would like to do is to introduce our keynote speaker for the luncheon here. Uh, this is Constance Thomas, and Constance is actually the uh, Senior Manager for Diversity for ASCE. She is the uh, staff member within ASCE that, that I work with on the Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. She started a, a little over a year ago, I think, and has really been, I think, a breath of fresh air. She has uh, a way of getting people to, to listen and not only listen but to act that I've never seen before. I'm very proud to, to work with her and to call her a colleague. So Constance, if you want to come up, uh, I'm very happy to introduce you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know your mouths are full, but I know you're here and awake, okay? Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that fabulous introduction. Um, and I, I want to give Sandra more credit that she's very bashful at times, not all the time, but at times. Sandra actually um, has been involved for years within the GEO Institute. Excuse me, I probably should use the mic. Has been involved for years with the GEO Institute, um, with diversity and inclusion. And actually, she's a large part of why this initiative has been started. She's been going that tough path of being the one with the big C on her chest. That's courage in diversity world. I'm um, saying we need to pay attention to this. This is the future. Why aren't we engaging individuals? Why aren't we acknowledging individuals? Why aren't we being inclusive in our practices? So Sandra, um, as members, you owe Sandra, Craig, and others a big uh, uh, clap of uh, gratitude for this coming to fruition. I'd like to give Sandra and the others a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Sandra mentioned, my name is Constance Thompson. I serve as the Senior Manager for Diversity with the American Society for Civil Engineers. There are actually 260 of us in a corporate office that work for you. A lot of members don't know that. And I happen to be one of those staff members. I'm at ASCE in Reston, Virginia. We also have offices, as you know, in Washington, D.C. Um, today, Sebastian and the uh, team asked me to come to speak to you a little bit about the fundamentals of diversity and inclusion. What is it? What it isn't? What's, why, why should we do this, basically? So I'm gonna share that a little bit with you today, but I'm gonna need your uh, engagement. So today we're gonna talk about a few concepts that you may be like, hmm, I'm not with you on that. I need a little bit more explanation. Or you may be right on board and say, okay, I got it. So if you understand you're on board, we get it. I want you to say aloha. Can you say that for me? Aloha, Ex aloha. If you don't, I want you to be silent because that's gonna be my barometer as to if I, if, if I uh, know that you're getting it, you're on board with me today. I'm gonna to take you through a just enough to be dangerous overview of these principles, but most importantly, I want you to think of these principles and this information as you have your table topics discussion. Because the end point here is that this diversity committee is gonna go back and say, okay, this is what members at the diversity luncheon said. This is their feedback to us. Members of the GEO Institute, Institute said this. This is what we're going to use to create our strategic plan. This is what we're going to use to create programs and other initiatives because we listened. So I want you to, to take this into under consideration, but most importantly, afterwards, use these concepts in your discussion as you're uh, talking about um, how to move the initiative at the GEO Institute forward. On board? Got it? Aloha. Aloha. All right. Perfect. So basically, as I said, what is diversity? What is inclusion? Attributes of diversity and inclusion in organizations. What's the business case for DNI? And this is something, when I have discussions with groups, they either leave very disappointed or they leave very enlightened um, in the discussion. So I'll be curious as to what you leave, disappointed or enlightened. But it is what it is. And last but not least, there'll be a brief Q&A after um, you all have discussed your table topics. On board? Aloha. Aloha, good, all right. All right, so when we start to discuss these concepts of uh, diversity and inclusion, a lot of people come at it saying, well, this is about compliance. This is about representation. This is about meeting quotas. It's not, that's a certain aspect of it. But there's a history to diversity and inclusion in organizations that you need to know before you engage in any discussion about diversity and inclusion that I wanna share with you today. And that is, so basically, equal opportunity is the law. Equal opportunity was established in our land because there were individuals there were systems policies, there were things in place that were not equitable. And the government said, you know what? We are the home, home of the free, land of the brave, if you will. We want to establish equal opportunity law. So equal opportunity is basically the law. When you talk about affirmative action, that's an enforcement of that law. 
So that's where the compliance piece comes in. And an example I like to uh, share with individuals is that how many of you have rules in your house? How many of you have things in your house that you just do not do? Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> All right. And, and I see hands and so forth. Give me an example of one. No smoking. So no smoking in your home, that's equal, that's the law. You do not smoke in my home or there are consequences and repercussions. That's affirmative action, the enforcement of that law. So what happens if you smoke in the house? You die. You die, okay. <laughs> well, the government has not said something as extreme, but <laughs> they have said that if you do business with us, there will be consequences and repercussions. So for example, that comes into, that's where affirmative action and quotas come. That's where organizations say, you know what, we, f we need this number of individuals in our organization to be equitable that happen to be female, happen to be from these underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. We have, um, we have some organizations even have quotas around those with varying levels of ability. Veteran status, all these groups that you hear that are preferred, that's where affirmative action comes in. So it's kind of like smoking in the home. That's the law, if you smoke in the house, you die in, in her home, if you will. If you smoke, <laughs> if we're gonna use smoking as the analogy here for an affirmative action, you don't get government contracts. You don't get the amount of business. That's where it comes in with a lot of businesses. It basically is enforcement of the law. And then we have diversity. Diversity is about managing similarities and differences in organizations. And if you notice, they are not attached here on purpose. So equal opportunity is a law. Affirmative action is that enforcement of the law. Diversity just is. Diversity would exist even if there wasn't equal opportunity, even if there wasn't affirmative action. Because the one constant in this universe is that we are all gonna be the same in some ways, we're gonna be different in some ways. That's diversity. And then you have inclusion, which is the goal of many initiatives. It's about maximizing all that diversity we have, all those differences and similarities we have in organizations. So many of you who are in organizations where they, uh, where the prevailing thought is that we're doing this for compliance, that might be your true diversity story. It may be, we're not about leveraging all the diversity we have. We wanna meet these numbers to get this business and that's what matters. I encourage you to encourage your organizations and to encourage you to have a language around that. Don't say it's a diversity initiative, it's about uh, meeting quotas, if it's about uh, getting certain numbers. It's not, it's an affirmative action initiative. A diversity initiative is about acknowledging all those things that we have that are similar and different in our organization, acknowledging those individuals that possess those qualities, and then inclusion is about taking all those things that make us the same and make us different to meet our mission of our organization. So there's a difference. Equal opportunity is the law. Affirmative action is that enforcement of the law. Diversity is about managing all those differences and similarities we have within our organization. And inclusion is about taking that diversity and leveraging it to meet our organizational mission or whatever goals we have in place. Aloha? Aloha. All right. So this is basically talking a little bit more about the differences. I'm gonna move to the slide fairly quickly. Attributes of diversity in organizations. What does diversity look like in organizations? Those items in red, are protected in some, in some sphere, whether they be on the national level, whether they be on the local level, whether they be on the regional level. Those aspects in blue are things that we generally have in organizations where pe people may not be acknowledged for it or they may be acknowledged only for it. So for example, you see here age, protected. Disability, protected. Some places sexual orientation and sex are, are sexual orientation is protected. These are attributes of diversity. Um, many that I see that a lot of organizations struggle with where the conflict comes in, job title and responsibilities, educational background, your skill set, your physical appearance. Some of those aspects are not generally as accepted or recognized in organizations, attributes of diversity. There are many more than just what's here. I've just listed what, um, what generally people see as diversity in organizations, but there are many more axes of diversity. All of these are everything, some of the things that make us the same, some of these things that make us different. Aloha? Aloha. All right. Inclusion. So what are attributes of inclusive organizations? So Constance, if it's really working, if my organization's really doing this right, what are some of the things that I would see going on in my organization? One of the things that I um, see in a lot of organizations is, um, didn't mention my background, but I've worked in Fortune 500 companies with diversity work. I've worked with um, Ivy League institutions in diversity work. I've worked with state 
local regional leadership um, in diversity work, and now I'm in the professional association world in diversity work. And one thing that I see that is constant in organizations that they struggle with this barrier is this transparent communication and information sharing. This will kill an organization. So the you die analogy here. An organization will die if you do not get a handle on this um, in an organization. And what that looks like is how do things happen? So for example, if we take the GEO Institute as an example, how do decisions get made around who's on certain committees? About how the speaker's chosen for the diversity luncheon? Who gets invited to diversity luncheon? How are we communicating that there is a diversity luncheon? How do we communicate that there's a GEO diversity committee? Those types of things. Is it transparent? Do people know about it? Are they placed in the same places things around the, uh, the practice of the profession are placed around? Is it transparent? And then are we sharing information in a way that reaches all aspects of the GEO Institute. To take that a step further, when individuals learn about opportunities in leadership in the GEO Institute, how are they notified if they weren't selected? How are they notified of that criteria? What is that criteria? Transparent communication information sharing, one aspect of an inclusive organization. Accommodation for diverse needs. And I'm using the GEO Institute as an example because I think this is something all of you can relate to. All of you can kind of say, okay, this is applicable, so I won't be using your individual organizations um, in that. When we talk about accommodation for diverse needs, a big issue that comes up in uh, societies are childcare at meetings or being able to bring a partner or spouse to a meeting. How do you engage that? Are you missing out on people coming to a meeting because they feel like they can't bring their spouses? Are you missing out on people coming to a meeting because they feel like they can't bring their partners? They can't bring their children to enjoy that experience? Another aspect, younger professionals. Many times there's a, uh, a financial repercussion to younger professionals and being able to engage in the profession. How are you acknowledging that? How are you acknowledging that barrier? How are you making an accommodation for that if you really are concerned about that? Um, equitable policy systems, et cetera, we'll talk a little bit about that again. But these are, oh, and demonstrated diversity commitment. So for example, um, Many organizations who want to uh, say that they're inclusive or want to demonstrate that they're inclusive, they have a diversity statement. And that diversity statement is everywhere that you talk about diversity. It's on the web pages, it's on printed materials, it's something that the board leadership can, can say without having to stumble upon the diversity statement. And most importantly, they know what that manifests as. They know what that looks like in the organization. So attributes of inclusive organizations. Attributes of diversity in organizations attributes of inclusive organizations. And I have some examples in a couple of minutes of how GEO can probably uh, deal with this uh, of being, becoming more inclusive. Aloha? Aloha. All right. The four phases of creating an inclusive organization. Now this is something I'm gonna fly through really quickly. It's just something that you need to know if you're gonna be on board with the GEO Institute's uh, initiative because this is the process you go through to creating inclusive organizations. There's four major steps in that. And in those four major steps, you may find that you may have to go to step one, back to step one again. You may find that you have to go back to step three again because things change in an organization. So the four phases are awareness, fairness, diversity management, and inclusion, the leveraging piece. And what that, so these are, there are questions you need to ask yourself at each phase in establishing these initiatives. And as you have your discussions this afternoon, think about this. Think about these questions. So the first phase is awareness. And actually where you being here today, the Craig being here today, Sebastian being here today, uh, Sandra being here today, even I being here today, and most importantly you being here today is a part of that first step in creating awareness. The question you ask yourself when you're in the awareness phase is, do people understand the meaning of diversity in our organization? What does diversity mean for GEO? What does diversity mean for your individual organizations? What is diversity? What is inclusion? So you guys can check off that first step of, I know what diversity is, I know what inclusion is, I know what it looks like in organizations because I've just heard a lot of alohas, all right? Some examples of that are your demonstrated commitment. So designing a, a diversity statement. Having leaders on the board, such as Craig here, saying, this is one of my key issues when I become president next year. Having executive leadership on board. Having an accountability group. So Sebastian is going to be leading the diversity committee. That's an accountability factor within an organization. The next is, some organizations say awareness. As I said before, some organizations say, you know what, we're not about this inclusion piece. We're about to get business. We need a certain number of heads and people that look like this to get our butts in the seat. That's not what GEO is about, but some organizations are about that. But they announce it as compliance and education. Again, what is diversity? What is inclusion? What are we doing? What are some best practices out there? 
as well. So awareness, do people understand the meaning of diversity in our organization? Aloha. 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 All right. I'm so impressed you're eating and you're still giving me the aloha. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> Sebastian's a joker. The next phase is fairness. Are our processes and systems fair and transparent? And I will say to you, the fairness phase is where organizations get tripped up because this requires individuals to be transparent in a way they've never been before. This is the phase where conflict comes up. I don't think like you do. I don't agree with you. I'm not gonna engage because I don't agree with you. And as organizations, if you're gonna be successful in creating inclusive organizations, you need to get past, get past this fairness phase. What it looks like, valid human resources processes. And basically all that means is talent. How do talent find out about roles? How are talent um, engaged in the organization? How are talent valued in organizations? How are talent, um, how are talent developed in the organization? Problem resolution systems, also known as conflict resolution systems. There is um, a lot of research out there about resolving conflict to lead to uh, effective diversity initiatives. And the bottom line comes down to you got to work through it. If there's conflict, don't run away from it. Deal with it. Work through it. And learn to value those perspectives that are engaged in the discussion. But your barometer is what? This is our organizational mission. When we resolve this conflict that we have in the end, this conflict needs to lead to us being able to meet our organizational mission. There's your barometer. And monitoring this. Sometimes this comes in the form of data. Sometimes this comes in the form of accountability measures. So diversity committee, we've given you this amount of money to accomplish this. What was done with that money? Sometimes it comes basically down to that um, thing. So fairness, are our processes and systems fair and transparent? Aloha? Aloha, Aloha. all right. Diversity management, in my opinion, this is the fun part. Diversity management, the question to be asked there is, how can we assure that diverse populations are able to contribute to our organizations? Once again, today, you are here to provide the diversity committee that feedback. The diversity committee was just started. The feedback you come with today is gonna help them be able to establish diversity goals, not, uh, not always um, goals in regards to representation, but goals that say this is how our members are gonna feel like they're able to engage from diverse perspectives in our organization. What that looks like, once again, transparent and equitable systems, policies, et cetera. I'll give you a hint. The more individuals who come from various backgrounds, various fields that are engaged in your processes and systems, you're gonna be able to innovate. You're gonna be looked at as a leader in the area that you're able to. Look at Google. I hate to use, I mean, Google is like one of the, the best examples out there. People get to come to work as they are. The bottom line is, what did you do today to help contribute to moving our Google mission forward? Come as you are, perform to your highest level, innovate. Clear and consistent communications. How are you communicating so that individuals in the group feel like they're able to engage? A very simplistic one in many, in many phases are, do individuals who may not be at the highest level of the organization feel like that they can come into a meeting and give their feedback, and it's valued, that they see that it was taken under consideration? People in middle management, do they feel engaged enough to be able to make some difficult decisions? Do individuals in your organizations feel as if they're able to bring their ideas and opinions to the table and that they're not gonna be shooed away because there's conflict resolved in that? And mentoring is another example of how organizations do this. Um, given this, the, the, the representation and what our future workforce will look like, you are seeing mentoring programs pop up at every corner of the world now. We need to show our younger people or our individuals who, who do not have as much experience as our top level individuals who are the graying, individuals who will be leaving, how this organization works, sh move them up into the ranks and make sure that this organization is sustained, mentoring. So diversity management, how can we assure that diverse populations are able to contribute to our organization? Aloha? Aloha. Aloha. All right. And last but not least, inclusion, which is basically the goal of diversity initiatives. Any great diversity initiative, it's not just about diversity, it's about inclusion. And one thing that I would uh, submit to you is that if you can change your behavior to stop talking about diversity and start talking about inclusion, you're gonna be way ahead of many organizations. You're gonna be way ahead of most individuals because inclusion is where it's at. And basically the question there is, how does, our orga how does diversity help us achieve our organization's mission? How does all of these differences and similarities we have in our organization help us achieve our organization's mission? And people, this is your business case. Whatever, whenever someone comes up to you and says, what's your business case for diversity? 
the question is, how does diversity help you meet your organization's mission? That's your business case for diversity. So if you feel that the more diverse and engaged our workforces, we'll just use workforces as an example, the more that we are able to innovate and make more money, whatever it comes to. But however you answer this question is your business case. And so developing an organizational case for diversity is an example of this, and making diversity and inclusion a part of the fabric of our organization, leveraging that. This is answered, this is a very, um, I'll call it intimate response, because it's so tailored to your organization. It's so tailored to how your organization works and why you're doing this. Inclusion, leverage basically. How does diversity help us achieve our organization's mission? Aloha? Aloha, Aloha. all right. I'm surprised because I usually get silence at that point. Okay, what? You just hit me upside the head with three different things and I get here, I don't know the answer to that. So I'm glad that you guys are a little further. All right. So developing a strategic focus, we're gonna move through this at lightning speed because this is just something you need to know as you're moving forward, not something that we wanna dwell on today for you to be able to answer the questions that are before you. Developing a strategic focus. Organizations, when they say, okay, we wanna have a diversity initiative, we're committed to diversity and inclusion, and we wanna show this. The first piece that many organizations move to is talent, the recruiting piece. That is wrong, because if you don't have a culture to welcome in this talent, to develop that talent, to acknowledge that talent, to move that talent forward, your initiative's gonna fail. So you work first on your organizational culture, then you work on your talent, then you work on your marketplace. If you are interested in a recruiting initiative to start off, if you just gotta do it, you're burning, deal with the people who are already engaged in your organization, who are already working at your organization. Work on developing them. Work on making them feel a part of the organization. Work on retaining them, retention, and then recruitment. So organizational culture, talent, marketplace are the three areas when you start your strategy and you're moving forward. Organizational culture, many times you do climate surveys, um, you do orientation programs, career and professional development programs. This is something that within the GEO Institute, if you really want to do things that I think will really move you forward, career and professional development programs is a good way to start um, in there. Um, the rationale is retention high employee morale, increase, increase productivity, increase innovation. And many times when you hear about this in the sphere of STEM, I work in the world of STEM, um, STEM policy, STEM, uh, STEM, 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 all day, every day. And when we talk about this, it's really about innovation. When the president talks about it, diversity and inclusion, it's about innovation. When you hear us talk about in organizations, it's about innovation. It is about winning this war on talent so that we as a country can sustain ourselves and be viewed as leaders. It's about innovation. Talent, um, to track and motivate key talent, basically an innovate work for, workforce focus. And then when we look at marketplace or external focus, many of this is about how do we, um, the perception of our organization. How do people see us as, as committed to diversity and inclusion? How do individuals see us as being responsive to our diverse customers? Okay, and then Sebastian asked me, he challenged me, he says, Constance, I want you to talk about what it is, what it isn't how it works in organizations, what it looks like, but we wanna talk about some best practices. So I have two for you. One is a company who happens to be one of the sponsors of the GEO Congress this year. Um, the other is from another professional society. At Parsons Brinkerhoff, they view it as a business imperative. They make no bones about it. This is about us working on global projects and having impact in global communities. And we feel that if we are not diverse, if we are not inclusive, we're gonna lose out on that business, we're gonna lose out on our reputation as an organization, and most importantly, we're not gonna be able to continue to innovate to be the best. So they basically, re reflection of the communities they serve, they want to be reflective of the communities that they serve. We have a couple people in the room who are with Parsons Brinkerhoff, so if you disagree, just yell, Liza, Liza, with Parsons Brinkerhoff. They have employee networks. They have networks that represent women, they have networks that represent African Americans, Hispanics, the organization, I believe you, you have a lesbian, gay, bisexual, group as well, you do, okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> you do in some of your locations, okay, <laughs> have that, okay. Um, they have a diversity oversight committee, which looks like the GEO committee that does oversight, saying this is taking the pulse of the organization. They have a professional growth network because Parsons has, is, has a commitment to their young professionals, generally professionals under 35, and um, developing them. And there are many best places to work list, you may not know this, but Parsons is on a lot of best places to work list. They also, um, from an ASC perspective, they participate in this program we have called the New Faces of Civil Engineering. Parsons out of, we get about 100 to 150 uh, applicants for this program, this recognition every year. They have about 10 to 15 that they're submitting every year of their younger members for this recognition. They also, in many of their local markets, are, are, um, have been awarded as a best place to work. Check out their website, they have some pretty interesting things there. But for Parsons Brinkerhoff, it's about innovation, 
It's about reflecting the communities that they serve, and it's about doing the right thing. The American Chemical Society, ACS, largest uh, society dedicated to the chemical enterprise that there is. They um, have a diversity statement that they developed from the board. Um, they, ha established a, um, they have established relationships with societies like the uh, Society for the Advancement of Ch Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, SACNAS, with ACES, the American Indian so um, Science and Engineering Society, um, with NOBACHE, the National Black Organization of Chemists and Chemical Engineers. But most importantly, they utilize those relationships to get people into governance roles within the organization, to make sure that they are representing the communities that they serve. They had board-directed best practices uh, discussions that happened, and they also uh, published publications on what the state of Native Americans in chemistry is, what's the state of African Americans in chemistry, the state of Hispanics in chemistry, and they use those to design their outreach efforts. They have a scholars program, they have awards programs, they have a Percy Julian Award that's pretty prestigious that they give out to uh, a scientist who happens to be African American, Hispanic, female, or Native American um, each year. And then they have efforts up on the Hill. They're one of the few societies, in addition to us, um, ASE, we will not be outdone, right? Um, they actually have representatives out on uh, Capitol Hill that are often engaged with decision makers up on Capitol Hill around STEM policy as well. So best practice, state of the art practices. All right, aloha. aloha, aloha, all right. So your table topics, your table topics that you have at your table here that we're gonna ask you to discuss for the next few moments basically are leading to how, how will GEO become a state of the art leader in the practice of inclusion? So how will the GEO Institute be seen as a leader? You're already a leader within ASCE, you got the first committee. You're off to a great start. It's 140,000 members, okay? You guys are off to a great start. How will GEO become a leader in the practice of inclusion? All right, and thank you.